Good morning, and a very warm welcome to all attendees, especially our distinguished panelists. I'm Dr. Geeta Mohan, editor from the Communication and Policy Engagement team here at CSTEP, the Center for Study of Science, Technology, and Policy, Bangalore. So today we are here to launch our report uh, titled Satellite-Based Mapping and the Quantification of PM2.5 in India, along with three policy briefs uh, uh, pertaining to the regions of Delhi, MCR, uh, Bangalore, and Kanpur. I request all to remain muted and to keep their phones on silent or vibrate mode, please. Also, there will be a Q&A session after the panel discussion. I now invite our Executive Director, Dr. J. Asandi, to tell us more about CSTEP's current work. Uh, good morning. Good morning and welcome to all of you. Uh, please, uh, apologies for the noise in the background. There seems to be some construction work that seems to start exactly at the time we have uh, the seminars. Uh, but that said, uh, a, welcome, a warm welcome to all of you. Uh, it is my great pleasure to invite you to this particular uh, report launch. What I will start with is a, a bit of an introduction uh, of uh, CSTEP. Uh, as you would know, the Center for Study of Science, Technology, Policy is a not-for-profit research organization uh, with a mission to enrich policymaking uh, using science and technology for a sustainable, secure, and inclusive society. Uh, that said, uh, a few years ago, we started with the Center for Air Pollution Studies because we did see uh, the value or the need for deep studies into not just the technology, but also the policy aspects related to air pollution. And uh, to that effect, I must uh, uh, congratulate the team on uh, setting the agenda and creating such a vibrant center, working on various uh, new ideas associated with measurement, modeling, and policy engagement. Now, coming to the aspect on measurement and modeling, um, measurement and uh, monitoring, uh, I think it's, uh, uh, it is great to have a partner in EDF that essentially came forward and uh, collaborated with us on this idea of saying that, well, uh, it's not possible for us to measure uh, air quality in every little part of India or even the world. So what are the various techniques that can be used to uh, enhance that? And to that effect, I'm very happy that EDF came forward and supported our work on satellite-based mapping. Uh, I would like to also add that uh, CSTEP is also involved in work related to energy and power, related to work in climate mitigation, working on issues on how digital tools can be used for uh, uh, enhancing governance or working with various aspects in India. Uh, and I must uh, uh, also add that we are also working on issues related to uh, the decarbonization of our economy and working on issues related to hydrogen. So given all these varied subjects, uh, a, a very vibrant place uh, to be working. Uh, so without uh, further ado, I must uh, also uh, 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 hand over back uh, to the uh, compare and uh, are looking forward to a very engaging conversation discussion. Uh, and this is something that I usually tell all people that uh, report is not the end. It is just the beginning. It is the part where we will now be able to uh, have a discussion on specific issues that we face in society. And hopefully this report will lead to some uh, ideating solutions and maybe some implementations on the ground uh, so that we can actually see a cleaner and more sustainable future. So thank you very much for joining us and look, look forward to uh, hearing from the panelists. Thank you, Dr. Jay. I now invite Dr. Indu K. Murthy, Sector Head, Climate, Environment and Sustainability here at CSTEP to introduce the Center for Air Pollution Studies or CAPS. Thank you. Thank you, Geeta. Good morning uh, to everyone and welcome to all to this event. I join Jay in welcoming you all for this uh, very important uh, report launch. So as Jay mentioned, we work on various aspects uh, and one of them is, of course, climate, environment and sustainability at CSTEP. 
So basically, we look at emerging issues uh, related to climate change mitigation, adaptation and resilience, environment sustainability, and air pollution. Uh, while our mitigation and adaptation work adopts an interdisciplinary approach, which includes, uh, like Jay said, modeling of environment, energy, and economic systems at various scales, uh, at the Center for Air Pollution Studies, we conduct air pollution monitoring measurement as well as modeling, and uh, mainly for informing uh, policy decision making and also to develop action plans. Uh, so amongst these three different aspects that we do, uh, the measurement and monitoring includes you know, mobile measurements, static measurements, uh, sensor network establishment, and of course, uh, the, the one that we are going to be discussing today are the satellite-based satellite -based measurements, which with uh, EDF uh, supporting this work, we've been able to conduct. Now, uh, as part of the uh, uh, monitoring, uh, clean air action plans have been developed by the team uh, for many cities around uh, India. And we've also been conducting source apportionment studies, emissions inventory, so on and so forth. And of course, with respect to this particular piece of work, as uh, Jay mentioned, uh, you know, the satellite measurements are very, very handy, uh, particularly in areas where, uh, you know, there aren't enough uh, network of monitors. Well, Interestingly, much of the monitors are in the urban spaces. So obviously to kind of capture the wider variations, the spatial variations, a satellite based mapping, all, albeit it would have some limitations, which we would be hearing about as we move forward, uh, but they are very, very useful. And we are very happy to have been involved in this work and all the best to this event. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Indu. I now invite Sri Partha Bosu, Lead Advisor India of the Environmental Defense Fund, EDF Delhi, to say a few words, please. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kulkarni. I really appreciate it. Uh, I want to start by congratulating Jay, uh, Shrikant, and team for the great work. Um, I, I think uh, this has been a, a very interesting piece of work. And um, before I get into that, those who do not know EDF, uh, well, it's an NGO based out of uh, New York. Uh, now uh, we work in several countries, including India. We started in about 1960s. And uh, we are, uh, we strongly believe in science, technology and market uh, oriented principles for achieving the social and economic benefits. Um, if you know the acid rain program of the US, uh, many of you might know that, then you should know that EDF uh, was responsible for solving that acid rain problem, uh, which happened in the US. Uh, well, uh, and, and sensors, uh, since uh, the speakers before me uh, spoke about sensors, and I think sensors is a very important area. Uh, EDF has been um, working in both the sensor space as well as the satellite space for a long time. Um, we have been working on uh, hyperlocal monitoring using sensors for about, uh, uh, 12 or 13 years now, and have been doing that in about eight or nine cities um, across the world. And uh, many of you might have heard about the Breed London work, uh, which received a uh, lot of good words. Um, having said that, I would also like to say that, you know, uh, we, uh, we, we, while EDF continues to uh, support uh, developing knowledge and knowledge products in the space of air quality, at least that is where I work. EDF has broad area of, uh, of interest. Um, and uh, as far as our work in India is concerned, we will remain small. Uh, we will need a uh, niche and uh, supply. And the way we will function is by partnering and supporting various organizations such as CSTEP. So right now we work with various organizations like NIDI, DTU, TERI, Indian Institute of Science, Jadavpur Universities, and so on. And I think uh, we have found a great partner with CSTEP, uh, uh, in, in especially uh, the kind of work that we have uh, started doing now. Uh, the last thing that I would like to say that uh, this work uh, that Shrikant and team have done, um, it, it, for me, it, it does three things. I mean, I, I look at it from a three action thing that is, is basically coming out of this great piece of work. And that is, uh, you know, it builds this indigenous regional and sub-regional model 
to leverage AQ data, which is something very, very, uh, very, very important. We are a populous country. And as somebody said that it is very not, not possible to monitor the whole of the country. And therefore, this is a very interesting and exciting tool. Um, the second part is, uh, yes, the data gaps that we have from several parts of the country, whether it is rural, whether it is mountainous, whether it is whatever may be the reason. And at least this gives us a good opportunity to get some kind of a uh, understanding of the situation. And last but not the least, I think this is also an exciting thing for the policymakers and regulatory authorities. Um, it gives them a, a snapshot of the areas to prioritize for devising and implementing air pollution and mitigation strategies. So our work with C-STEP, we are very excited. It is a testament of uh, our commitment to knowledge and capacity building for institutions and state governments on newer monitoring methods like this and offering more pragmatic solutions rooted in sound scientific principles. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sri Bosu, for your kind words and encouragement. Um, we will now go on to launch the report. We at C-STEP are now delighted to launch the report titled Satellite-Based Mapping and the Quantification of PM uh, 2.5 in India, along with three policy briefs pertaining to three regions, Delhi NCR, Bengaluru, and Kanpur. The links will now be available on the chat window, and you can also access them later from our C-STEP website under publications. I now invite Dr. Srikant Vakacharla, Senior Research Scientist, and Dr. Padmavati Kulkarni, Research Scientist, both from CAPS, to present the key findings from the report. Please keep your questions for the Q&A session, which is after the panel discussion. Over to you, Srikant. Thank you. Gita, can you hear me? Yes. Gita, can you hear me? Yeah. Are my slides visible? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the title of this uh, work is Satellite Based Mapping and Quantification of PM 2.5 in India. Okay, now uh, just have a little. Okay, uh, this is a brief background on this work. Okay, uh, we all know that air pollution affects human health. Not only human health, air pollution also affects um, <clears throat> uh, weather and climate change. Also responsible for uh, events like acid rains. It also impacts crop yields. It also forms haze events, all these things. And we understand that air pollution is very bad for us. Okay. <clears throat> but this air pollution varies very rapidly in space and time. India, being a uh, developing country and middle income country, the sources are too, too much heterogeneous. The source and the source times are too much heterogeneous. That's why the pollution varies very rapidly in space and time in our country, uh, not like Western countries. Okay, that's why we need high spatial and temporal measurements or uh, information on these uh, pollution levels in order to understand its dynamics and in order to understand its spatio temporal variability across our region. At the same time, uh, the ground-based monitoring is very sparse in our country. The monitoring that is being conducted by uh, pollution control boards, both central and state pollution control boards, it is very sparse. It is not uh, sufficient. It is not adequate to understand the dynamics of air pollution power space and time. Okay, and also the regulatory monitoring, the, the ground-based monitoring is very limited to urban areas uh, without uh, any coverage in peri-urban towns and in rural areas. On the right side, you can see a map with the green dots. All the green dots uh, represents the uh, regulatory monitoring locations. They are the continuous ambient air quality monitoring stations. Yeah, this is this doesn't include the manual stations, but continuous air quality stations. Yeah, among uh, various air pollutants, various gaseous and uh, particulate air pollutants, uh, PM is one of the major pollutant 
and uh, the disease burden attributable by uh, attributable air pollution is mostly driven by this particulate matter pollution okay this particulate matter pollution among this uh, there are two uh, uh, pollutants by name pm 2.5 and pm 10 which are identified and uh, labeled as criteria pollutants for those who uh, don't know about this pm 2.5 and 10 i will uh, just introduce the 10 stands for its size in microns any particle having size less than 10 micro microns it is termed as pm10 and any particle which is having size less than 2.5 microns micron is 10 power minus 6 meters it is termed as pm2.5 and if you see uh, the pm2.5 particle size it is almost 20 times lesser than the size of your head strand and if you see pm10 it is five times lesser than this is an approximation five times lesser than the size of your hair strand. And these PM10 particles, they can go up to your upper respiratory tract, while PM2.5 can go up to your lower respiratory tract, and even they can enter into your bloodstream, and they can uh, do a lot of damage to your health. Once they enter into the bloodstream, they can grow, they can go anywhere in the body, including brain, everywhere. Okay. In order to quantify this PM2.5, we have our conventional regulatory monitoring, where we use these kind of instruments on the left side you can see a near real-time instrument uh, on the right side these are uh, manual stations with the filter based monitoring uh, generally these instruments are being maintained by pollution control boards and uh, there are some <coughs> research organizations who are uh, conducting these kind of measurements if you see these instruments they are very bulky at the same time very costly and we need technical expertise to operate and maintain okay India being a middle income country, I think it is very difficult for us to have a dense network of these monitoring stations due to its cost, due to its expertise required and all other things. Okay, that's why using these monitors, using these measurements, I think it is hard to understand the pollution dynamics across space and time across the whole country. Okay, if you want to have a spatial map of pollution, especially PM2.5, there are some other approaches. One of these, uh, some of these approaches I have out is here. First thing is modeling. Uh, in this modeling um, aspect, what we have to do is solve for mathematical equations and we will try to um, estimate the pollution level over high spatial and temporal resolution. But at the same time, this modeling requires some inputs on pollution emissions. Okay, another one is satellite based estimates. Okay, this the current report is based on this kind of approach satellite based estimates satellite gives you some information about aerosols and I'm, I'm not saying it as pollution but aerosols and this information we will use and we will try to estimate the surface pm 2.5 all this pm 2.5 when we call it is uh, all the pollution levels we measure at the surface and at the same time there is another approach called low cost sensor approach as the name suggests it is low cost that's why we can buy more and more uh, uh, sensors and we can deploy in bulk in dense uh, network and we can have uh, <clears throat> again we can use some modeling techniques to arrive at high resolution spatial maps of pm 2.5 uh, uh, these are the advantages of these approaches but at the same time we have some limitations also that means a reference grade instrument the accuracy of those instruments of are the data that is coming out of from that instrumentation is very high but when you talk about these other alternate approaches there will be always some uh, a range or an envelope of uncertainty associated with these kind of estimates okay uh, coming to the satellite based approach generally uh, the satellites um, especially polar orbiting satellites they have good global coverage on a daily basis and they can give high spatial resolution data and we take some one particular uh, uh, parameter that satellite gives and that parameter uh, we use to uh, convert into or estimate ground level pm 2.5 the uh, the satellite the advantages of this method is like we have uh, daily high spatial resolution graded data from satellites at the same time these data sets are in public domain we can use it free of cost okay, what is that parameter that parameter is nothing but aerosol optical depth. This aerosol optical depth is not like PM 2.5, but it contains information about the aerosol columnar load. It is not, um, it is not uh, related to a particular height or surface, but total columnar load it is 
it contains information of total columnar load. That's why uh, it is a columnar quantity, unlike PM2.5, PM2.5 is a surface quantity. At the same time, it is an optical measure. It's not unlike a PM2.5, which is a physical measure. And at the same time, this AOD is sensitive to aerosol microphysics. Uh, this is about aerosol optical depth. But at the same time, if you see, all the pollution sources are on the surface of the earth. That's why we can consider the columnar load of uh, aerosols is mostly governed or mostly dictated by the surface uh, processes. That's why uh, we can do, uh, we can estimate PM2.5 based on this aerosol optical depth measurement. And this aerosol optical depth is available from a suite of sensors. There are so many sensors which use this aerosol optical depth. One is this MODIS moderate resolution imaging spectral radiometer, which is very popular and it gives at one kilometer by one kilometer resolution. That's why most of the studies <coughs> use MODIS aerosol optical depth to estimate PM2.5. At the same time, we have MISER uh, multi angle imaging spectral radiometer. At the same time, OMI VARS. VARS also is very recent uh, sensor and it can also give one kilometer by one kilometer aerosol optical depth. If you get aerosol optical at one kilometer by one kilometer, then we can we use that uh, AOD product and we can estimate PM2.5 at one kilometer by one kilometer. That's what we have done in this particular project. And MODI sensor is uh, uh, available on two uh, satellites. One is uh, Air, uh, Aqua and another one is Terra. Both of these satellites belongs to NASA and the data is publicly available. And for this project, we use this MODIS aerosol optical depth with a high resolution, and we try to build a statistical model. And we <coughs> made spatial maps of PM2.5 at high, very high resolution. Okay. Now I, I request Padma to take over from here. Yeah. Thank you so much. Hope I'm uh, audible very clearly. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much, Rikan. So uh, just I'll walk you all through quickly on our uh, a few important results on the satellite-based mapping and quantification of PM2.5 in India. The, there were three main objectives of our study. One is the estimate high-resolution PM2.5. As he mentioned, Shrikan mentioned, high-resolution here we mean one kilometer by one kilometer spatial resolution. So estimate the high-resolution PM2.5 using satellite aerosol optical depth product and further quantify these spatial gradients from urban to peri-urban or from peri-urban to rural regions. And finally, once we have the spatial maps, we can identify the PM2.5 hotspots and provide some policy recommendations. So these were the three main objective of the study. And the study regions includes, you can see down uh, the Delhi NCR, which includes Delhi NCT and surrounding districts of Uttar Pradesh, uh, Haryana and Rajasthan. Whereas Kanpur, we have done the spatial mappings for both Kanpur Dehat, that is rural, and Kanpur Nagar, where Kanpur Urban is located within the Kanpur Nagar district. And finally, the Bengaluru region. Here also, uh, we include with the spatial maps we have done for the entire Bangalore Urban, Greater Bangalore, or Peri Urban, uh, Bang Peri Bangalore region, and also for the Bangalore Rural. These spatial maps are done for the uh, year 2019. Yeah. Next slide, please. Yeah. So, as he already mentioned, the approach what we have used here is the statistical model. We trained the advanced statistical model that is called as a linear mixed effect model, as many of you may be knowing, to estimate the daily mean PM2.5. What it does, what we had done is we incorporated the day-specific random effect in AOD and PM2.5 relationship so that it can control the day-to-day -day variability in the AOD and PM2.5 uh, relationship and we have used the aerosol optical uh, depth product and the many meteorological parameters and land use proxy as predictor to train the model and uh, we have used the uh, pm 2.5 from the pollution control board that is regulatory monitors as the response variable and finally uh, wherever wherever the interpolation techniques are needed to match the variable spatial temporal resolution we had done those, we have used those interpolation techniques as well. Yeah, next slide, Shrikan. Yeah. Uh, so these are the select variables which are used to train the model. The first and foremost is the aerosol optical depth, columnar water vapor, and normalized 
different vegetation index that we had taken from the Modi satellite, which is available freely at one kilometer by one kilometer spatial resolution and the temporal resolution resolution uh, for daily for AOD and columnar water vapor, whereas for every uh, eight days for the normalized uh, difference vegetation index. And we have used the meteorological variables also from the reanalysis data, that is ERA-5 data, that is temperature, relative humidity, wind speed and direction, planetary boundary layer height, surface pressure are taken from the reanalysis data which were available nearly at nine kilometer and the hourly data has been used for this particular study and also the elevation that is a digital elevation model from there we had taken the data and finally very important the pm 2.5 as the response variable that we have taken from the continuous ambient air quality monitoring stations they are the point data sets and we consider the we have taken the hourly data set so these are the select variables to train our models yeah next slide please yeah this is the model performance this is a leave one out cross validation is shown here we built two models as per the uh, difference in aerosol uh, sources meteorological parameters so we built two models one is for delhi ncr and kanpur region and another model for the bengaluru here you can see this is the density scatter plot which is showing uh, measured daily mean PM 2.5 versus the predicted daily mean PM 2.5. You can see the coefficient of uh, determination that is R square values 0.81 for the Delhi model, whereas it is 0.65 for the Bangalore model. You can see the number of data points that are around 9,400 for the Delhi model because ha we have a many more stations in that region. While the Bangalore, we have a few stations uh, like a uh, few stations, that's why number of data points were less. But when you look at the NRMSC value of both the models, it is almost comparable. So these are the two models we have taken. And using these uh, model coefficients, we had done the spatial maps. Next slide. Yeah, these are the annual spatial maps for all the three study regions. The first one is for Delhi NCR. Second one is for Kanpur and the third one is for the Bengaluru study region. And if you look at the first one, Delhi NCR region, relatively higher values have been seen at the, most of them seen at the Delhi NCT, which is at the center and the surrounding regions also. And also some of the uh, southern part of NCR, which includes the Faridabad, Goregaon, uh, Nu, Palwal and Bhadrapur districts. Those districts also shown the relatively higher uh, PM 2.5 values. And every grid, you can see the values were ranged between uh, P uh, 95 to, uh, sorry, 90 to 130 microgram per meter cube. And annual mean PM 2.5 was nearly 100 microgram per meter cube for Delhi NCR. When we look at the Kanpur uh, region, you can see the Kanpur region, Kanpur urban location, that is Kanpur city showed relatively higher PM 2.5 values. And the mean value, mean annual values were around 108 microgram per meter cube for the Kanpur region. And also the for Bangalore, if you see the uh, color bar, it's almost thrice the lesser than that of the Delhi NCR and the Kanpur. It varies between 35 microgram per meter cube to 55. And if you, if you see the, again here also, Bangalore urban location has shown the uh, relatively higher values around 55 microgram per meter cube and the surrounding some peri-urban that is greater Bangalore also uh, shown the some of the higher values and also some regions in uh, rural also you can see relatively higher values between uh, 48 to 50 microgram per meter cube. So just here I wanted I want to mention I think many of them have told the major limitation of this uh, satellite is we cannot have the data during the cloudy conditions. So these uh, annual maps could be overestimating because we have uh, some gaps during the monsoon month. So what we had done is we thought of doing the, to understanding these maps spatially, seasonally. So we divided this maps into seasonal. You can see these first four set of uh, figures are for the Delhi NCR, seasonally for winter, summer, monsoon and the post monsoon. And the next right side, it is for the Kanpur. You can see it has shown significant both spatial as well as temporal variation in these seasonal maps. You can see winter was the highest and most of the, most of the uh, PM 2.5 was relatively high at the Delhi NCT region. And you can note here, 
winter uh, the north eastern parts that is uh, most of the uh, uttar pradesh uh, districts are showing the higher values during the winter and next was next highest was the post monsoon followed by summer and the as expected monsoon was the lowest similarly for the kanpur also it was the maximum uh, was shown in the winter and followed by the post monsoon summer and the minimum uh, pm 2.5 values were for the monsoon so next for the bangalore also we had done the same exercise that is these are the seasonal maps for the bangalore uh, here also same winter shows the highest followed by not by post monsoon here the next highest was the for during the summer and next it was post monsoon and the monsoon you can see there are some data gaps in the monsoon season this is mainly due to the cloudy condition during june july august september if you if you if you know the bangalore region is entirely covered with the clouds so this is the main uh, limitations of our study so there are data gaps has been seen for the monsoon month particularly for the bangalore region yeah next slide yes further we try to understand the urban annual maps these are the only for the urban uh, regions the first map is for the delhi nct these are the 11 revenue districts overlaid on this map you can see shahadara is the is the revenue district where the pm 2.5 values were very high relatively high like 126 microgram per meter cube and the south west was lower around 113 Microgram per meter cube, and when coming to the uh, Kanpur urban zones, here Kanpur uh, region city is divided into zones. Total six zones. The highest was was for the zone one, and the least was for the zone two. You can see zone two here in the map. There is a, some green agriculture land is covered in that portion. That's why the values have. come down and there is one point to be noted here in the zone 5 there is a one coal based power plant situated in zone 5 their surrounding region also peaked very high around relatively high around 130 microgram per meter cube and similarly the bangalore urban zones compared to both delhi nct and uh, uh, kanpur urban relatively less spatial extent, extent uh, the 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 higher values are there in the bangalore urban zones they are mainly uh, highest was for rajarajeshwari nagar and the south uh, zone and whereas the lowest was for the mahadevpura zone yeah so and also the values you can see the values are almost three times lesser than that of the kanpur and delhi ncr further we try to once we have these spatial maps we try to uh, do the hotspot analysis so we have used the gi star index to do the hotspot analysis again same the order is same first one is for the delhi ncr next one is for kanpur and the third one is for the bangalore you can see the all the hotspot uh hotspots are concentrated at the uh, most of them are concentrated at the delhi nct and the surrounding districts and some of the scattered Uh, some of the scattered um, hotspots are there in the uh, uh, new palwal and uh, the bhadrapur districts faridabad goregaon and also meerut you can see most of the urban locations i have shown the hotspot in the delhi ncr region and when uh, coming to the kanpur you can see entire kanpur city has shown the hot as a hotspot and also the bangalore annual uh, maps hotspot map also shown the uh, the bangalore uh, uh, zones like rajareshwar nagar dasralli south uh, west and the bommanhalli zones have very clearly shown the hotspots and the hotspots were extended for the peri urban regions also and also also for the rural areas and uh, here to note the peri urban uh, locations which where the where we have seen the hotspots they almost coincided with the uh, the uh, stone crusher stone crushing areas which have a higher concentration of pm 2.5 yeah these are the hotspot analysis further once we have the map we also try to understand the uh, try to quantify the uh, spatial gradients in terms of urban to peri urban peri urban to rural and rural to uninhabited so these are the box plots showing for all the three regions for the annual mean pm 2.5 for the different settlement area as expected urban was high in all the regions 
followed by peri-urban and the rural. Here, point to be noted here is, you can see hardly a difference is seen between urban and peri-urban and rural. There is, they are very shallow. They are not steep as expected. There is not much difference between the urban and the peri-urban. For, bank, for uh, if you see the Delhi, it's hardly seven microgram per meter cube difference is there. When you, when you look at the Kanpur, it is just two microgram per meter cube difference between the urban and the peri-urban. While it is almost almost the same for peri-urban as well as the urban for the Bangalore region. So these are the very important and alarming things for us to make more understanding on the peri-urban as well as for the rural areas. Yeah, next slide, please, Shrikant. So these are the quick, I'll summarize very quickly. The first one is the PM 2.5 in Delhi NCR and Kanpur is almost thrice that of the Bangalore. And most of the hotspots I already explained are coincided with the urban areas. And we have not seen the steep uh, spatial gradient, but we have seen the shallow spatial gradient in PM 2.5. Based on these uh, seasonal annual maps, we have done few policy recommendations like using these maps, one can uh, policymakers as well as the regulatory authorities can prioritize the areas or the location for impl uh, implementing the mitigation strategies. Uh, and also uh, using these maps, we can establish one can establish the representative continuous monitoring stations beyond the urban areas. Also, right now they are in the urban areas only. So, and also there are uh, city specific uh, city specific action plans are already um, uh, running in uh, most of these cities like Delhi NCT. Kanpur city as well as Bangalore city, but we have seen some of the uh, peri-urban uh, regions like Brooklyn activities or the stone crusher activities. So once if we bring the peri-urban areas also in the scope of city clean air action plans, one can have the uh, better uh, uh, mitigation strategies. So these are the three policy recommendations we have, the main important policy recommendations we have summarized in our report. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Padmavati and Dr. Srikant for a very illuminating presentation. Uh, it is indeed fascinating as well as alarming to uh, see the results on the spatial uh, maps as well as uh, you know to see the seasonal variations and the variations in the urban and peri-urban areas. I do hope uh, uh, authorities and everyone concerned takes note of this and brings in uh, and implements policies to uh, indicate these. We will now move on to have a panel discussion on the state of non-conventional air pollution monitoring in India, moderated by Dr. Pratima Singh, research scientist and lead air pollution dom domain at CSTEP. I welcome our panelists today. Shri Patra Bosu, Lead Advisor, India, Environmental Defense Fund, EDF. Shri Mahesh T, Chief Environmental Officer, IC, KSPCB, Bengaluru. Dr. Vinay Kanavada from the Center for Earth, Ocean and Atmospheric Sciences, School of Physics, University of Hyderabad. Dr. Naveen Puttasamy from the Department of Environmental Health Engineering, Shri Ramachandra University, Chennai and Sri Rodak Sutadia, founder and CEO, Respira Living Sciences, Private Limited, Pune. Our panelists, Dr. Ravindra Khaiwal, Professor of Environmental Health, Department of Community Medicine and School of Public Health, PGI Mark, Chandigarh, is unable to join us live today, and I sent us his message through a recorded video. Over to you, Dr. Pratima Singh. Thank you, Geeta. Thank you so much. Uh, it's really our pleasure to have such an eminent people working in the sector of uh, using non-conventional measurements for estimating PM. So I welcome everyone. It would be really good if everyone can please switch on their camera. And Srikant, if you could uh, remove the screen, that would be better. Yeah, exactly. Perfect. So um, starting with Partha, thank you so much for supporting this study. And as you mentioned that uh, you are considering more such studies going forward in future. And hence, I, I definitely wanted to understand that as in 
funding organization working extensively with a lot of organizations and the policy makers uh, how do you think that we can influence the use of non conventional sources uh, to drive uh, i won't say policy but the regulations uh, for air quality management right thank you pratima uh, i want to clarify first thing is that we are uh, not a traditional funding organization uh, but we have definitely interest and i understand where you are coming from uh, and because uh, out of nearly 1500 people who work for edf nearly uh, 700 are scientists so that is why probably our science is is one of the dominating factors of how we you know make our decisions of which direction to go you see uh, alternative methods of uh, monitoring is something that we have been i mean edf loves that and uh, uh, the biggest mistake uh, that a country can do and and being in india we can do is not to do research i mean if we are if you get scared and stop doing research and say that oh what will people think and what is going to be the result uh, i i i think that is uh, that will not be good especially given that given the position and the skill and the talent that we have in the country so i i i think the continuous process is something very very important uh there is a lot of work which is going on the sensors pratima as you already know uh, people uh, from different uh, civil society organizations and and scientific technical service providers are doing a lot of work on sensor based work and i think uh, and i i must congratulate also uh, for this excellent event because i can see the kind of questions that are coming on the chat box which is which basically shows the level of engagement of of uh, the people which is excellent and i think you know we will not we will it will be it will be very expensive and time consuming for us to put uh, our cqms everywhere so if the ground truthing can be done using uh, sensors uh, maybe that's a way so alternative methods is something which is very very important and the step that shrikant and his team has taken uh, you know in establishing this model is a fantastic piece of work uh, and uh, i mean lastly our proof of our work uh on on the methane sat uh, as you know that where we are launching the methane satellite uh we are already delayed because of covid and uh, uh, so our our satellite on methane emission uh, monitoring is is a proof that we like alternative methods edf is a part of certain committees uh, where we are uh, um we are we are discussing the possibilities of having the frameworks in place of uh you know how alternative methods can be given it at the end of the day pratima it depends what is the kind of question that we are willing to ask if we straight away jump to probably aqi then maybe we are uh, you know uh, we are pushing it too hard but if we are already just looking for trends and trying to get an idea of areas where there is nothing at the moment i think that's a very good start so we will continue to push we will continue to support and this is exciting work thank you very much thank you partha for you know elaborating because my second question was exactly what you have answered <laughs> so it's really good to know that uh, what your vision is going forward in terms of monitoring and it would be really good to see how this work can be taken forward at at the national level also to the tier 2 tier 3 cities where we have challenge of reference grade monitors and how do we come up with new models so yes looking forward to your support and ideas going forward thank you pata sir thank you i would like to now uh, uh, engage with mahesh sir from karnataka state pollution control board sir if you could switch on your camera yeah uh, mahesh yeah, yeah. yeah it is there yes yeah, switch, yeah. switch it on sir um, i would want to know from you that under national clean air program um, we are required to increase the monitoring network in the city right so to identify the hotspots uh, we usually uh, carry out emission inventory and source apportionment studies and understand but satellite studies also one of the crucial studies that we have carried out and apart from that there are low cost sensor monitors also which gives a very good understanding on uh, what the city landscape looks like in terms of air pollution issues so do you think that pollution control board should look forward or 
to the results that the study has offered. And based on the findings of these study and the low cost monitoring, we should increase our reference grade monitors as we identify the hotspots from these studies. So what do you think about that? Yeah, th thank you, Dr. Pratima. Um, yeah, it's a very pertinent question, actually. Uh, you know, as you mentioned, uh, the under the National Clean Air Program, we are uh, enhancing the number of monitoring stations, actually. See, in the state of Karnataka, uh, we are monitoring uh, the air quality through uh, the manual stations. We have about 39 manual stations. And uh, then uh, we have about 31 continuous ambient air quality stations. These stations are uh, predominantly located in district uh, headquarters, actually. And uh, city like Bangalore uh, have got more number of stations because the city, you know, the limits are uh, huge. So in Bangalore, we are monitoring uh, seven locations through CAQM stations. And uh, the Central Pollution Board is also monitoring the air quality at three locations. So altogether, 10 locations. Of course, many industries are also, uh, you know, uh, established uh, the continuous ambient air quality stations, uh, basically uh, in industrial areas. So for example, uh, the Bangalore International Authority, Airport Authority has established one station, Biocon established one CAQM stations, Haikal has established, uh, uh, that is in Jigni, one station. Likewise, uh, many industries have also established the CAQM stations as per the, uh, you know, the conditions stipulated in the environmental clearance. So, you know, under the National Clean Air Program, uh, you know, we are adding four more stations for Bangalore. Uh, we are looking at, uh, you know, the results of your study also. When we, when we identified the location for CAQM stations, in fact, we have gone through the report, satellite-based uh, report, and uh, for example, you know, the Raja Raja Shrinagar, for example. So that location, uh, since uh, no stations are there and it appears to be a hotspot, we located one station close to Raja Raja Shrinagar. Similarly, uh, you know, when it comes to Bomanali, uh, we have planned to set up one station uh, in the electronic city, actually. We have already identified station close to, you know, the uh, electronic city industry association and they have agreed to you know uh, you know spare station for us so likewise uh, wherever because uh, you know it is already mentioned that uh, it is a laborious process actually it is uh, time consuming and also it requires huge manpower and it adds a lot of uh, you know uh, you know we require a lot of money for that actually so considering all those aspects uh, and uh, the <coughs> with the limited capacity of spcbs especially with regard to the manpower uh, you know we we can't afford to have stations in all the places all around and the management of uh, the air quality data itself is a huge task actually that we are experiencing now it is not that easy uh, because it requires dedicated manpower, dedicated infrastructure, competent and trained manpower for that purposes, actually. So we have a lot of limitations in continuous ambient air quality monitoring also. So it is not just uh, installation of CAQM stations, but how we are running efficiently, that is more important, actually. For that, we require a lot of uh, you know efforts uh, and resources. So the competency, resources, our uh, continuous efforts, it's all required to ensure that the data what we get from CAQM stations is reliable and uh, which will help for decision making. That is very important. So as of now, we are facing a lot of, uh, you know, the problems related to CAQM data, in fact, uh, to be very uh, honest. So considering that actually, uh, you know, the, uh, the kind of uh, study what you have undertaken through satellite based testing, definitely, uh, or low cost sensors definitely will come to the aid of the state pollution boards. And if this issue is taken up at the national level with CPCB and MOF, and if they develop some protocols, definitely it will reduce the uh, burden on the SPCBs 
and give uh, very valuable uh, results, valuable and uh, reliable results to the public actually. So without right. much uh, efforts. So right. we welcome, we welcome such more. That is a brilliant idea to take uh, this kind of study and models at, at the national level and convince MOFCC and CPCB to consider this for you know developing interventions and control measures. Also, sir, I just want to ask you that now under uh, National Clean Air program, uh, program, we are required to develop a state level action plan, right? But as you understand that beyond uh, Bangalore city boundary, there are very less number of stations reference grade stations, right? And if you look at other cities also, it's not completely covered with good number of stations. So do you think that if we conduct uh, this satellite kind of measurement uh, at a state level, it will be helpful for you? Definitely, definitely. Because, you know, we don't have any data uh, for the rural areas, actually, and semi-urban areas also. A lot of activities. It is not only you know, the industry or transportation, it may be mining activity, it may be, a, you know, stone crushing activity, uh, you know, contributing for uh, higher air, uh, higher level of particulate matter. So we have not studied, we don't have much uh, idea uh, as far as the air quality in uh, rural areas are concerned. Whenever some complaints comes, uh, we go and monitor that too for 24 hours and uh, we uh, interpret the data for 24 hours to entire year and uh, conclude on that. So definitely this kind of uh, continuous studies through satellite uh, based imageries will help the state pollution control board to uh, come to a conclusion that, okay, this is the overall air quality of the state and uh, these are all the hotspots and uh, what kind of measures are required to ensure that the air quality improvements take place in those hotspot areas. Actually, it will definitely help uh, the SPCBs to plan for proper uh, air pollution control mitigation measures. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your support. And we'll definitely, you know, work with you to understand the requirements and take it forward. Thank you Thank so you. much. Thank you. Thank you. Now, I would want to invite uh, Ranak Sataria. Uh, Ranak, I want to, want to understand that you have been extensively working in this um, area of measurement and monitoring uh, through using low-cost sensors. So, um, Given the range of uncertainties that, that we face with a low-cost sensor monitoring, uh, what are our views on how do we improve our devices and how can this uh, the data that we receive from the low-cost sensor network be used for a regulatory and policy purpose? There has been a lot of debate in the country on this, and um, I would definitely want to hear your opinion. So on, on what, what is the future of these methods uh, and, yeah, going forward. Yes, Ranak. Yeah, uh, thanks so much, Pratima. And uh, thank you for inviting me. I uh, really appreciate the work that, you know, uh, CSTEP and Srikant and your team is doing. Uh, with regards to low-cost uh, sensors, you know, yes, we've been working on it since 2015. Uh, and we've seen a significant transition, both from the technology perspective and how the regulatory government and policy has shifted, you know, over the last four or five years. So, uh, with regards to the specific questions, you know, the range of uncertainty with regards to this technology, initially, you know, yes, there were questions, but now with a large number of scientific studies, you know, including uh, with the researchers and scientists at uh, organizations like yours, you know, the uncertainty is fairly bounded. You know, it's not like the data that comes from this is completely unpredictable and uh, uncertain. So there are known uh, bounds that are uh, available for this. You know, it has been peer reviewed several times. I'll just quickly show you what typical uh, data. I mean, this actually is literally done from two weeks ago in Rajasthan. You know, and we're rolling out a network with the Rajasthan State Pollution Board and IIT Kanpur. Now metrics like when you say, are the uncertainties, are there any bounds? So you can see that, you know, uh, uncertainties are measured in either percentage errors or R squares. And they are fairly bounded. You know, you can see that they vary between eight to uh, fifteen percent. The more important metric is the inter-device, which we find is very valuable because that helps you scale the network in, in a significant way. You know, the correlation with BAM is done at one location, but you will see that uh, these this technology consistently provides up to 0.9 to 0.95 inter-device accuracy. Essentially, it means that it allows you to get consistent results from a large spatial region. 
So that kind of answers one part of the question with regards to the uncertainty of the estimates. Um, with regards to regulatory purposes, you know, and frankly, I will share my perspective on this, that the manual monitors, as the speaker earlier mentioned, you know, that Karnataka has, I believe, 39, he said, but uh, in India, I believe there are about 800 manual monitors. And uh, really speaking, manual monitors have been the backbone of the policy work, especially around uh, NCAP. Now, continuous monitors, you know, are being deployed. They come at a significant cost. It requires expertise. Um, what is the specific regulatory purpose they are currently meeting is still, I think, being understood. Uh, they help us, of course, validate things like, you know, the hourly data from them, validate the satellite data and stuff. But specific regulatory action so far from uh, continuous monitors, I mean, it's not very clear. Uh, MOFCC, you know, these are officially documented minutes of the meeting where they've said that air quality monitoring is not necessarily limited to regulatory purpose, but it has use for urban planning, neighborhood monitoring, uh, hotspot identification. Correct. So, you know, at the highest level, there is recognition for um, non-regulatory requirements from air quality monitoring. So that's, you know, as far as what I would say with regards to this. Um, applications in terms of public policy, I think is very clear that citizens at the end of the day are going to believe data which is coming you know, nearest to them. If somebody told you 10 kilometers away, air quality is at a particular standard, you know, you're going to be like, you know, it doesn't matter. You know, frankly, I am breathing air quality, which is five meters, 10 meters from where I am. Uh, quick summary of this technology, frankly, you know, it is low cost, it's part of the term. Uh, it is going to, I mean, definitely right now it is at a particular price point. It's going to come down to a point where every traffic light in India is going to give you this data. And maybe even every, you know, light pole is going to give you this data. It, it is literally going to become that affordable. And at that point, as you know, the pollution control board members said that the data handling is going to become a significant challenge. You know, can you imagine 10,000 looking, I mean, US already is handling, I believe a paper is published with about 15,000 low cost sensor data. So this is exploding, you know, handling this data is going to be a challenge <coughs> and folks like us, you know, and you guys are bringing the scientific rigor to the work, but it's a collaborative exercise. You know, I don't think one agency can solve this. You know, we are not going to solve it. You're not going to solve it, but collectively, I think something can happen. Correct. So that's what I'll share. So uh, Ronan, just taking that thought forward that you said that the prices are going to come and every every traffic signal is going to have one such monitor and, and capture the data. So do you think that uh, the existing instruments, the accuracy of these instruments needs to be taken one step ahead so that when this huge data set coming in, we don't face such problems from the instruments side? It's a very valid question. And, you know, there is right now uh, proposals that have been uh, put out right for sensor development also. So I think what happens is currently while we are making monitors, sensor development has not happened in India. We import from Europe, you know, there is a Swiss company, there is a Chinese company, there is a UK based company. <laughs> that from. The fundamental leap in technology will, will happen when we actually start making that because some amount of humidity and background handling needs to happen at the sensor level and sensor fault detection. So I think the quantum leap, honestly, as I see it, which it's not too far, is the development of the actual sensors, which I believe proposals are at the uh, PSA office and, you know, let's see where they go. But that will bring in, that, that's a thousand crore uh, industry, you know, and India will save a huge amount if it does it in-house. So both from economic and technology perspective, we see that there will be significant breakthroughs that happen once that starts happening in India. And so and I, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because if we start developing these sensors at India level, we will have better hold on on the device yeah. itself. I think yes. yes. Uh, thank you for those inputs, Ronak. Thank you. And, and it is our pleasure to have you here. And mm -hmm. you being the one working extensively, it is, the pleasure is completely ours. Thank you again. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, can, can I have Dr. Naveen uh, on the screen? So Dr. Naveen, uh, welcome to, to the panel. And uh, is Dr. Naveen here? Yeah, I'm here. Yeah. Yes. Hello. Hello, Dr. Naveen. Hi. Hi. So uh, we have known that you, you are working extensively in the health sector. You know, you do a lot of health-related studies uh, 
because of air pollution. So we would want to understand that when we talk about a non-conventional method of measurement and monitoring, how does it help towards the, uh, understanding the health aspect? And what are the challenges associated, if you could elaborate that with it? Because till now, we, we all have understood that for health studies, you need to have extensive research work and a lot of rigor. But as we are moving towards use of non-conventional uh, technology, do you think it will be useful? How useful? And, and yeah, going forward. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Pratima, for the question and, uh, and also for setting the stage for why uh, unconventional methods or non-conventional methods for monitoring is important. Uh, not only for the air quality perspective, but also from the uh, health effects research point of view. Uh, we have had some experience in the last five years working with uh, real-time monitors, which, uh, which our primary objective was to get the, the spatiotemporal resolution to link it with the health outcome. So what we have learned in summary is the choice of the health outcome when we use this real-time monitor is important. Whether you want to go for an acute uh, health outcome like uh, an asthma exacerbation or the lung function, or do you want to go for a long-term health outcome such as a neurodegenerative disease? In, any, in either of these cases, understanding what is the exposure being used for in an exposure response analysis is very important. Uh, a primary example of using satellite data or the, uh, uh, the non-conventional method of monitoring on health is the global burden of disease estimate. And also, uh, the hybrid models, like the pure study that's uh, done in 22 countries, wherein there is amount of uh, household air pollution monitoring uh, are done, uh, the measurements being done, and then there is a satellite and they kind of develop this hybrid model. So uh, it is very important to, uh, to know the choice of the health outcome, then choose the exposure uh, of modality that is of, uh, in question. Uh, with respect to low cost sensors, we uh, our primary work happens in household air pollution, which is in the rural area. And we've also worked in Delhi, where uh, we used another sensor uh, called as AirSpec, developed by the University of Edinburgh group. And there was mixed reaction in the way these uh, sensors really work. But uh, end of the day, it's as uh, uh, Rona rightly mentioned, the backend data analytics is, is a very important tool. And uh, people should be there who are expertise in uh, understanding the data, dealing with this huge amount of data that finally comes calibrated, cleaned, and ready for use in health effect analysis. Otherwise, it's just all over the place. And we just cannot not even contain the uncertainties and bias, but also the completely uh, wrong amount of data in a health outcome analysis. So we are uh, very close to uh, uh, using the uh, publishing out the results from the Daphne study, the Delhi Air Pollution and Health Effect Study, wherein it took us almost eight months and several models to build to uh, get these uh, data cleaned. So this is novel in its uh, instance uh, because we use these real-time monitors on asthmatic children for 48 hours. They carried this. And we also did a PFR measurement, which uh, they used uh, a particular instrument to blow into it and give us the readings in real time and also the breathing rate wherein a small sensor was put into the chest area. Now, all of this put together, we want to understand how these asthmatic children in Delhi are responding to events of high pollution load in the early mornings or the late evenings, and what is the latent time of an uh, asthma exacerbation. So this, at, at, the, uh, at the very minutest level, this is how the, the real-time data would be useful to really characterize, is it really the uh, episodic event that has triggered an asthma, or is it generally the long-term exposure to very low concentrations, such as 25 microgram or 30 micro, which is not the case in Delhi, but I'm just saying. Uh, the other experience has been working with the mother-child cohort, wherein we recruit pregnant women, and we really can't put the real-time monitors yet on them personally, but in the micro environment. So far, uh, the research in, uh, has been that we measure 24 hours PM 2.5, and then uh, kind of estimate a gestational period exposure for nine months. So for the first time, we are using real-time monitors, again, from Rona Group, wherein we are monitoring it for the entire trimester and choose health outcomes such as blood pressure uh, and the HbA1c and uh, the birth weight, which are in, in a time scale or a shorter period. And we want to understand 
some of the concentrations during this cooking event goes up to 5,000 to 10,000 microgram per meter cube. So are these high peak events that cause is a, a, a change in a short term health effects like bed pressure, or is it just the 40 microgram average across the gestation period of nine months that causes a effect on the birth weight? So these are some of the uh, work that we've, we've been doing. Uh, so uh, it's definitely uh, a way to go forward, uh, provided there is a, a, a good um, good practice document on how to use these sensors in research, because we coming from the health, we sometimes do not understand how do we put these monitors to use. It comes to our hand and we tend to spend a lot of time in understanding this. Thanks to Ronald's team for helping us out there. Uh, but then uh, these kind of events and uh, you know, training modules where people can take up more on our research side uh, using these low-cost sensors and how the applications are you now profound when it comes to that, uh, to do the health research. So definitely uh, going forward, this is uh, a, a very important aspect. Thank you, Dr. Navin. First of all, congratulations for your study, Delphi, that is coming out. Uh, mm -hmm. We are excited to have a look at it. And second, uh, you rightly mentioned that it is very crucial for us to have a, you know, a framework, a uh, a document that can un that can make us understand how these devices can be used. So yes, um, probably Ronak would be working on that going forward. Yes, uh, thank you so much for your inputs yeah. and the study insights that you have highlighted that um, how the women face from during the cooking time to the entire gestation period. It's quite interesting and um, I am hopeful that these instruments are able to provide us insights into these minute detail is something that we should be, you know, taking it forward and making it used in, in all the studies. Thank you so much, Dr. Naveen. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Uh, now, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Vijay Kanaude. Dr. Vijay, uh, you're Hi. with us, right? Yes. Hello Hi. and welcome. So uh, I would start that uh, being an academician and working extensively in, in this um, domain of air pollution, uh, what do you think that uh, under the National Clean Air Program also during, I mean, with a lot of studies that is happening around the air pollution and India still learning on how to use these devices, on how to, you know, uh, work on the calibration and, and the accuracy and everything. Uh, it, it's really moving very fast. So how do you think we use these instruments to first strengthen our knowledge base in terms of all the gaps that are available in terms of understanding any landscape? And how do we, you know, expand this understanding at the country level in terms of the sources that are present and the level of the pollution that come from these various sources? Uh, right, uh, that's a very good question, Dr. Patima. And, and let me thank you for having me. And I'll, uh, let me congratulate Dr. Srikant and the team for a really ex uh, excellent piece of work. Uh, coming to your question, uh, as Dr. Partha uh, clearly mentioned, you know, our efforts should be, uh, it really depends upon what basically we're looking at, whether we just need a trains or as an economy, I may also microphone. So I will be looking into more process level understanding. But but we also know that the, the non-conventional uh, monitoring methods, you know, whether it's a satellite based or, you know, using low cost sensors or even the mo mobile monitoring. And, uh, it has, it has, you know, proved or it has showed that uh, the robustness and the, the air quality management uh, in India. And as, as just showed by Dr. Padmavati, we can clearly, you know, identify the hotspots uh, using these kind of non-conventional monitoring method. And we are aware, you know, we are limited by certain things. We, if you go with the conventional methods, we know the associated capital cost. Uh, for all these conventional methods. Uh, and, and secondly, uh, the air pollution is not just an urban problem. Uh, it's, it's like, as Dr. Mahesh also mentioned, you know, we don't have uh, air quality monitoring stations, you know, in semi-urban or uh, rural location. So it's, it's kind of a complex mixture. Uh, it's just not just emission that, you know, uh, occurs uh, at the surface and then the, you know, things are suspended in the air. 
but there's a lot of chemistry dynamics and micro which is going on right so it's a it's a co- complex cocktail that you know we need to understand what i feel that you know what we probably need uh, the accommodation and since i'm looking into more process and understanding we probably need a, a homogeneously paced a very high homogeneous space and temporal you know network of more conventional methods because the non conventional methods will definitely you know adding a uh, lot of information like identifying the hot spots so we can have a directed you know the uh, efforts for those locations specifically with more conventional methods so they they these two methods should go hand in hand uh, yeah i think that that's what i feel uh, should be the way forward thank you dr vijay for highlighting that yes we need to have an hybrid approach going forward yes, yes. and not only to understand the city but also the urban and the se- semi urban regions and that is the yes. requirement right now yes. uh, as of now we we have only 132 non attainment cities but probably we start measuring in our tier 2 tier 3 cities that will rise yes. drastically yes. um yeah thank thank you for your inputs and i just wanted to highlight that yes today's panel was again very homogeneous in terms of expertise people working in the area so thank you everyone for being part thank of you. the panel and providing inputs thank you so much over to you geeta thank you dr pratima singh uh, dr shrikant is it possible to run the uh, video sent by a panelist who could not be here today dr ravindra khaiwal please yes sir ram can you play the video uh is the footage uh is the thumbnail visible to everyone yes 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 okay i'll play the thank you for inviting me to this uh, very prestigious initiative as you know that uh, it is at the time that we link uh, how the air pollution is associated with uh, health effects and there are studies but not long term studies so first thing that we need to focus is that long term study but at the same time we face the scarcity of the data and i am sure that satellite data and the local sensor data can provide this opportunity to have the minute detail of micro environmental consultation and linking it with the personal exposure so in near future if we work in this direction we can definitely help to provide regional and local evidence because the pollution consultation and its constituent they may vary from one place to another place sir so uh, at this time i am sure that if we work together having a holistic approach where the ground based monitoring as well as the satellite phone monitoring is being integrated with the health uh, outcome will be providing the sufficient evidence to link with the policy decision and this is how we can make a change thank you and i sincerely regret because i am in the vigyan prasad for the national science day celebration and as you can see uh, our honorable minister will be here and i need to join him so once again thank you and we'll uh, meet you on soon yeah thank you so much so now we we'll move on to the q and a session we have already uh, gone beyond the time limit for the day so we'll be taking just a few select questions uh, up for uh, discussion now uh maybe the first one uh is one doubt your lme model depends on observed pm 2.5 so can i assume that the limitation is we cannot compute satellite pm 2.5 in areas with no ca qms rural area and what do you think can be the solution to this problem dr shrikant yeah. Yeah, um actually if you have the predicted data you can Uh, estimate PM 2.5 at any location. It's not the obviously the PM 2.5 
that has gone into the training of the model belongs to the whole um, urban areas only from the regulatory monitors only. We know there are no regulatory monitors or no data available from rural areas. The model has been trained using regulatory monitoring stations, which are from urban areas. But we have the predictors, like the, predict the meteorological parameters, uh, aerosol optical depth, and land use proxies in terms of NDVI. If we have those predictor variables over every any grid, we can predict PM 2.5 over that grid. But one limitation is like we can't um, validate the predictions for our uh, rural areas because we don't have any monitoring stations that's why one of the limitation of the study is we are not able to validate the rural predictions but we we made a small attempt like in uttar pradesh uh, there is a, one organization called igp care which is in rural uttar pradesh we have taken that data mm, from uh, igp care and we tried to validate our predictions for that particular one particular rural location station and uh, those results are provided in the appendix of this report. I think you can refer to that. We can predict rural as long as we have the predicted data. Okay, so that question was sent by Shivang Agarwal. But moving on to the next question. Uh, when we tried a similar method for Bhubaneshwar, the main challenge was with the lack of continuous monitoring data with requisite quality. It will be better if the C-STEP team could also discuss the difficulties they faced when doing this work. Yeah, this is from Inoja, you know. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, we, we face a lot of challenges, that is for sure. Okay, one thing, like if you see, we built two, two models. Okay, one is uh, for uh, Delhi and Sayer region, another is for the Bangalore region. If you see the number of data points that have gone into the model building, obviously Delhi and Sayer uh, are 10 times higher, like around 9,000 data points we have our Delhi and Sayer region. Because this uh, report is indented for policy purpose, we are trying. We are trying to. We try to uh, predict daily mean PM two point five, where we have these uh, limits, like a sixty microgram per meter cube is the limit for daily mean. That's why we try in this model to predict daily mean PM two point five. Okay. Uh, the main challenges is like the cloud cover. A uh, lot of uh, missing data from uh, um, satellites during uh, uh, monsoon season, especially over Bangalore. That's why there's a lot of hardly we got two three days of data uh, for Bangalore aerosol optical depth. So there's a lot of data gaps in uh, monsoon this thing. And again, there are a lot of quality checks that we have made um, because some sometimes these uh, uh, regulatory measurements or these uh, continuous ambient stations they they, they have some uh, 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 error if there is any error of if there is any spikes in the data or transient or uh, uh, high values. We try to remove those uh, kind of data points. We cleaned a lot. All these uh, uh, steps that were uh, um, that were adopted for this uh, model building or cleaning the data that were elaborated in the report. The main challenge is the, the data availability, and the second challenge is data cleaning. Like we extensively clean the data to get some signal uh, from that uh, measurements, and at the same time, uh, the model also depends. The model, uh, the model um, effectiveness or the model. This thing depends upon the number of data that we give it for training. Like uh, the, the Delhi model was performing very good, like in terms of uh, model building or in terms of uh, residuals, in terms of uh, uh, other health parameters of the model. Because we have around 9,000 daily mean data points, because we have so many stations that, uh, that is available in Delhi and Sierra region. And it comes to, you might have seen the uh, live one out cross validation exercise. Mm -hmm. If you see the, the one is two, uh, the linear fit is not exactly following the one is two online there. It is a bit deviated. The slope is around 1.12. Uh, that's why uh, these are the main challenges like uh, uh, the data availability and data quality. And at the same time, we predicted our rural areas. We don't have any data to validate our rural prediction uh, because the AODP and 2 point relationship can be different over uh, rural areas because the sources will be completely different in rural areas. Question was sent by Dr. Vinod Jvi. So now we'll take just one more question uh, sent by Professor Devara. How effectively and accurately do you do the ground truth CalVal exercise? Uh, CalVal validation exercise. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon, everybody. In Thank fact, you for joining, sir. I have been I have been listening very carefully the expert lectures here. But I am left with the two main questions. Sure. One is one is the title shows that uh, 
retrieval of pm 2.5 from uh, aod data uh, which hardly anybody talked about so that is very very important from health point of view we have been talking from decades to the about aods and then heart spot detections everything is okay uh, but that part just we begun but uh, other countries people have gone very much forward that is one thing i wanted to tell because we ourselves have done cohort studies and then where uh, in fact at uh, this stage we have been comparing our uh, uh, pollution levels with uh, uh, look up look up tables look up tables to identify the particular disease and then tell but there is no parallel clinical analysis available with the body measurements or pollution measurements whatever measurement you want to make that is number one that is very crucial thing and then very complex thing we know the difficulties involved but if you do if you retrieve to the possible accuracy the pm 2.5 values from eod whether it is ground based or satellite it doesn't matter but that conversion itself accurate conversion itself is very uh, important thing that is the need of the hour and then that is very much important otherwise this aerosol research will not have that much value unless it is linked up accurately to the health problem because that is a societal problem that is very much important that is the number one number two is of course i have been listening earlier even in this meeting also the requirement of low cost sensors to enhance the data size but i wanted to know what happened to the size what we have already prepared so much data available what what is the need for us to of course i i to agree with you people that more and more data are required but not more and more some critical points critical situations data still it is missing we have to we have to get it by hook or crook we have to get it i agree but you see where the limit for the data size anybody i i it is a very difficult question what the size you you okay you develop some more low cost or high cost or medium cost sensors and then collect the data what the what the requirement what you will fulfill do you can you develop any simple to medium to any complex model which can decide the optimum distance between two data points what for you require more number of sensors so what you are going to achieve then what we have the wealth of data we have right now cpcvs are there and then suffers are there mapans are there so much and in addition to these networks we have individual data individual networks are also there local networks so much data available and then now i have been carefully listening that is one thing of course you have to seriously work can we develop any model by which can we point out this is my data length two data points this is the interval spatial or temporal we need to attack the particular health problem can we develop any model to get that uh, uh, optimum data requirements rather than go on asking okay this uh, uh, is a gap area we require some more sensors and to collect the data what happened to the data we have already collected what is the concrete thing that of course uh, even though i am talking a little bit hard but uh, this is the requirement let us be frank so this is one thing another thing is when we are of course i have even uh, dr padmavati stock i heard very closely because i know her work earlier also so i was closely following but the heart spot detection and all it is not a nowadays thing long long back heart spot detection has been made with uh, satellite data ground based data but what next what next with what accuracy with what accuracy you see now we are making aod ground based values and then satellite aod values still we are struggling to correct the satellite data using the ground truth but to get the data where is the accuracy for the ground truth measurements 
ground based measurements so my sun photometer measures something with some calibration constant somebody somebody's uh, sun photometer measures something else either any uniform calibration for all the aod data what we are collecting we have done during the major programs like indo x and all earlier so we had super super calibration sites and then we have formed super calibration sites all the equipment are brought there and then simultaneously operated found out the common calibration factors go back and operate the instruments use those calibration factors so that data uniformity homogeneity in the data that first of all we have to achieve that then you talk about the uh, variabilities hot spot how accurately we could detect the hot spot and all so this is very very important calibration uniform calibration because even satellites even modis we have been using decades to their modis data but very even now also modis data is not perfectly uh, calibrated so all the time we are left with the problems that no 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 cloud cover is there we are not getting the aod values correctly no even during clear sky days what are the calibrations achieved so far so ground truth calval programs what we have done many programs with even with isro satellites irsp3 p4 p5 p6 and then many things we have done but there are inequalities but we have to correct these things thank uh, we have had a few more questions but uh, our researchers will respond to them via email due to constraints of time uh, on behalf of all at c step i thank each of you for attending this launch and for your active participation we are grateful to our panelists and uh, all the uh, attendees today who have shared their views on this platform we encourage you to go through the report and the policy briefs which are now available on the c step website and revert with any queries and feedback have a wonderful week ahead goodbye and thank you